Okay, hi everyone. We are going to get started. Um, hello and thank you for joining us today. My name is Natalie Orsling. I'm an assistant director here in the Alumni Career Development Program at UChicago. If you're joining us today during our Young Professional Series, it's a two month long whirlwind of panels, webinars, just and, and discussions aimed at supporting those who are entering the job market, making a career change, or just lifelong learners. Um, that's one of the things this webinar is about today. Welcome to the business behind the camera content creation. For many of us, social media platforms are places to learn, connect, and engage with people, places, and ideas we may not encounter in our everyday lives. But the idea of moving from content viewer to content creator can be daunting, especially when there are so many platforms out there to join. This is why I'm really excited for today's panel, which will be filled to the brim with excellent UChicago alumni who are making names for themselves as authentic content creators. Um, I'm not going to waste any more time and introduce our moderator, Toby Belay. Toby is an incredible storyteller. She's working in the worlds of fashion, TV, and music. Currently based in LA, she is the senior campaign manager for the fashion and lifestyle group at Disney and a talent manager for TV, TG Beam, a rising multi-hyphenate artist. She is featured on TEDx San Diego as a speaker this year. She's a published novelist of the teen fiction book, The Stunners co-host of the podcast, The Weekly Bay K, and the editor and brain behind The Girl with the Purple Gucci's. With all that and more, she has a lot of time, things going on and she has found time to lead us today. Toby, thank you for being here today. I am going to hand it over to you and our amazing panelists now. Thanks, Natalie, and thanks everyone for joining. We're super excited to get into everything with all of you today. I'm gonna start off by introducing Vivian Tu, who graduated from the college in 2016. She's also known as Your Rich BFF, and she's a former Wall Street trader and strategy sales partner at BuzzFeed in the past as well. And she turned her full-time financial literacy, and she's turned herself into a full-time financial literacy creator. In a year and a half, Vivian has grown her audience to over 1.6 million on TikTok and a whopping 617K on Instagram as a side project. Her mission is to bring financial tips, tricks, and knowledge to undeserved individuals such as women, LGBTQ plus youth, and BIPOC communities. Vivian is also exploring opportunities in the podcast, publishing, and TV space. And moving on to Alex Perez Garcia, who also graduated in 2016. Alex is a social impact leader who believes in the power of personal narrative combined with smart strategy, data, and research in solving society's biggest systemic problems. She's currently a dual Master of Business Administration and Master of Public Policy candidate at the University of Michigan, specializing in mental health and healthcare management. Formerly, Alex was Associate Director of Development and Communications at Disability Lead, where she grew the nonprofit startup organization through high quality strategic fundraising and community outreach. Also, as an inaugural member of the Obama Foundation Community Leadership Corps, Alex founded an online community focused on mental health fueled by young voices of color. In the first month launched the platform, which featured lived experiences of mental illness, including her own, was read by thousands of people across the country. Because of her work, Alex was selected as a featured speaker during the 2018 Obama Foundation Summit. She graduated with honors from UChicago with a bachelor's degree in psychology and in public policy. And last but not least, Chloe Tan, who is class of 2023. Chloe is a rising senior studying economics and data science at the college. Currently, she's a product management intern at Intuit with the goal of pursuing product and data science after graduating. She started her YouTube channel, It's Chloe Tan, in 2018, following her acceptance to UChicago and Oxford, and since then has posted videos sharing her UChicago experience and her life as a college student. She has created content for 114,000 subscribers on YouTube, and has been sponsored by the likes of Notion, Skillshare, HelloFresh, and more. Chloe has also been featured on CNBC, Make It, Gen Z Money, and Business Insider. Her hobbies include photography, playing video games, reading contemporary fiction, and building fun apps with her friends. If you have any questions, you can find her on Instagram at it's Chloe Tan, as mentioned earlier, or via email at txrchloetan at gmail.com. 
So now that we've introduced everyone and you've heard their amazing backgrounds, we're gonna start things off quite broad. So how would you all define your personal brand? Vivian, why don't you start us off? Yeah, I would say my personal branding is focused on revamping finance. Um, historically, financial services has been very, very male, very pale, very stale, lots of people in suits, and I am not that. Uh, I think it's really refreshing for people to see someone that looks like them, looks like I could be anybody's bestie from college talking about a topic that has historically been very antiquated. My personal brand focuses on revamping finance for the next generation, teaching them easy, accessible tricks that they can use every single day, and just making talking about money much less taboo. Awesome. What about you, Chloe? I think um, I kind of went the more organic route. I didn't really have like a purpose like brand image that I was trying to cultivate. I kind of just posted content about myself and surrounded it around my daily life. And so, for example, before I got into Chicago, that was what my content was about, it's like how to get in. And then after I got in, it was just following like my daily life and so forth. And so I think with that, you know, with basing your personal brand just off of your personality comes with a lot of like safety caveats as well. As a result of that, my personal life is very integrated with my YouTube channel. And I think that's something that you can have to like weigh whether you like that in your brand image or not. Yeah, for sure. And I think we're gonna touch a little bit about that last part you said in a little, but I have a question that I think Alex would be great to start us off with. What is the process of building an authentic virtual content presence and how do you do so? Yeah. And I can kind of tie the two questions together. So um, I would say that my personal brand is deeply rooted in authenticity, vulnerability, um, and accessibility, um, both because who I am as a person um, and also the impact and mission-driven personality that I try to bring in my work, whether it's in school, outside of school, um, extracurriculars, various leadership opportunities, et cetera. Um, and I think that, uh, that that really encapsulates um, what I've made as a priority for my personal brand, but then also my uh, career, um, which brings me to uh, building authentic virtual con uh, content and how I've been able to use my personal uh, lived experience um, and leadership to really navigate a career pivot and to create greater purpose in the work that I do. Um, as you mentioned in the intro, um, a big spark moment for me was having the opportunity on a global stage to tell my personal story and create a platform for others to tell their personal story around mental health. Um, and that led to, you know, really digging deeper and helping found a nonprofit around disability and, and really be enveloped and um, welcomed by a amazing and um, supportive uh, disability community in the Chicago region. Um, and so by being authentic, sharing my story and really digging deep on my why and what makes me tick and what I want to get out of my career and my, the work that I do, um, that's how I've been able to, you know, create, quote unquote, create content or share, I, I like more share content um, with the world and uh, really use that to drive my career forward and drive my purpose forward, more importantly. That's great. Yeah, the why is everything. Um, and Vivian, how about you? Because we've heard that you had a bit of a happy accident to start <laughs> the journey. Yeah, exactly like Alex mentioned. Um, creating content wasn't something that I sought out to do. I never said, you know, hey, I'm going to be an influencer. Here's my checklist of things I'm going to do. I very literally made one video thinking that seven of my coworkers who had been bothering me about helping them rebalance their 401k accounts uh, were going to watch. And by the end of the week, I had 100,000 followers. So to your point, it very much is a happy accident. And I think that is part of why I get to be so authentic. I never sought out to be this aspirational influencer. I wear what I'm wearing. I don't put on a blazer. I don't put on a tie. Um, there are times I create content with like eye patches and like zit cream on my face. And that's just because I'm living my life my friends behind the camera that are watching my content are going to see me how I am versus how I try to present myself to be. I think it's really important for them to see that 
someone who talks about being responsible with their money and making smart decisions is also a real regular person who buys, you know, $18 worth of chips and candy at the bodega when I'm on my, when I'm on my period and I don't feel good and I just want to, you know, have a little treat. So I think it's really important to showcase all those little facets of your life in addition to the content that you want to convey. That's great. Yeah, I would say that authenticity is everything. And it's something that corporate companies, everyone is really trying to tap into. But I mean, at the end of the day, if you're as close to yourself as possible, that's what's going to resonate with people the most. So moving on, what would you say is your one piece of advice for someone who wants to break into this world of content creation and share their personal brand with the world? Um, Maybe Chloe, we can start with you since you've had um, a quite recent journey as well in your time at the college? Uh, Honestly, narrowing it down to one piece of advice is kind of hard, Um, but I'm going to say that um, draw boundaries around yourself. Um, Even if you're someone who's very organic and very authentic, like for example, when I was building my brand, I wanted it to be that people were attracted and following me because they liked me as a creator or as a person, hopefully, um, and not because like the value I can provide to them. That's like a very conscious like pivot I made because that's what I wanted to do. And as a result of that, I posted a lot of, you know, more like vulnerable things about myself. I have this ongoing kind of like, kind of series, kind of not called like deleting after 24 hours where I put the camera in front of me and I just rant. I don't edit. I like barely look like anything in the camera. It's like really dark, but I talk about like my anxieties and my like issues so far. And then after 24 hours, it's gone. So it really is not optimized for growth, but it's just more to let viewers know how I'm doing in like a non-permanent way. Mm -hmm. So that is my way of like drawing out a portion of like my personal, personal life to share with the internet, because that's what I'm comfortable with. Right. But I would say that that has the biggest toll on whether something is sustainable or not is being able to draw your own boundaries. Um, It's like, what is something I'm comfortable with sharing? Like my sharing stops at my family. I will share about myself. I will not share about them, for example. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, Alex. Oh, I was going to say to give the opposite, like kind of like part of that argument. um, I've been really, really focused on growth in my channel for the past year and a half. And the one thing about growth, and this is like very contrary to all advice you've ever been given quantity over quality. (laughs) Everybody, I want to make the perfect video. I want to make the perfect content. You won't, you're never going to be happy with it. Mm. I There's content that I spend eight hours on and think it's going to be amazing. Nothing. There's content that I spend 15 seconds on and it goes viral. And I'm like, wow, everyone really loved that piece of content, huh? I wonder why that is. And you just never know because the algorithms on these social media platforms are changing so often. So even if you don't think a piece of content is your best work, put it out there anyway, see how people react to it. Every piece of content gives you data about that audience and how you can make the next piece better. I think that I just, I'm sorry, I'm just going to like cut at that really quickly. I think like that's a hundred percent true. And as someone who like recently started a TikTok account, I think like the TikTok's black box algorithm exactly works like that. But I don't think you should have that mindset on YouTube. Um, I personally think that YouTube is really painful because you not only have to be consistent and like, you know, you post once a week, but you really do have to push at like the best content you possibly can because people are not going to be recommended your videos if you consistently have like five subscribers, right? It's a very different from TikTok where the algorithm, you know, pushes it out based on hashtags. YouTube, the algorithm based, pushes it out based on your search history and watch history. So just a little caveat there for people who like maybe long form media. That I do think quality sometimes does matter more than quantity in the sense that like if you post five times a week and it's like bad versus if you post one time a week and it's high quality, but the quantity is still there, you know, I still got to post like once a week. Small, small little. No, thanks for that, Chloe. I mean, that just goes to show the difference in platforms and how you have to have a different approach because one size fits all just isn't going to work on socials in this day and age. So it's good to see um, both standpoints and how everyone here can apply them. So I think both Alex and Chloe touched on this a little bit earlier, but how do you all navigate mental health and the ups and downs of it, especially when you're creating content creation? 
Yeah, and I can um, tack on to the last question in terms of advice um, and, and, and start in this and then leave, and then let others talk, talk as well because I touched on mental health in my earlier answer. Um, in terms of advice, uh, I think it's really important to identify what your North Star is. So for me, my North Star is to become a cross-industry leader in the mental health arena. And for what that means in terms of content create creation and, and boundary setting, like Chloe, you mentioned, is I haven't really created a lot of content in the last few years because I'm focusing on my skills. I'm getting my MBA, MPP. I'm really investing in myself um, away from the camera. And I think that those moments are just as important as being in front of the camera how are you investing in yourself away from the camera, whether it's, you know, pursuing additional education, you know, upskilling some of your, um, your skills on, with online courses, et cetera. I think that that really does lead back to mental health because it keeps you on track. You're reminded, what's my North Star? What am I trying to build towards? Um, and then it doesn't feel like you're just like creating things or putting yourself out there for no reason. And there's like some validation and justification to what you're doing. But Vivian or Chloe, I don't know if you have anything additional to add. I would say that for, you know, navigating mental health, it's like changing your mindset. Um, I like when I first started creating content, I was just like on a high constantly because my content was going viral. It was amazing. And then I want to say like three or four months in, I had like a little bit of a dip where not every video was going viral anymore. And I started to be really, really self-conscious. I'm like, am I not like funny or smart or cool anymore? Like has, has the moment passed? Um, and it took a lot of soul searching to be like, why am I tying so much of my validation to how these, how these pieces of content are doing? And also, you know, being able to push through those tough blips of downturn and continuing to create content because had I stopped then and there, my channel wouldn't have grown to the size that it is today. And I think that having a good set of friends and being able to take time away. And like Chloe said, like set boundaries of how much time you're willing to spend on these social media platforms and how much of your self-worth you're tying to it is really important. Yeah. I was think just thinking about how I was going to answer this question while listening to like Alex and Vivian's answers. I think that there are two main things I think of when I think of like tying my mental health, like how my mental health has changed with my channel. The first one is, as I mentioned, that like video series I decided to start, like deleting out to 24 hours. And the reason why I decided to do that was just because I just hit, I think like 10,000 like subscribers. And I think this was like two years ago. Um, and it was like a really big moment for me, but I was feeling really crushed because I kept comparing myself being like data science person. Um, I would track all of my like similar YouTubers, like other like adjacents. So essentially like Asian women who are also college students. Um, and I was tracking like how much they posted and their growth and all of this stuff. And I was growing so slowly and I just didn't understand why. And I remember I did the whole like full SEO dive. And then, I mean, now it's easy because now I have like a hundred thousand, right? But at that point, it just felt like I had put in, you know, 10 hours a week to like no avail. And I think it wasn't until I started just like, I'm going to put in however much I can and that's it. And if it goes viral, it goes viral. If it doesn't, then it doesn't because I still like making videos and I started feeling like I was just chasing after the numbers and cliche, but like really important. Second moment is when one of my videos went viral, like exactly a year later from that point. Um, it grew to, I think like 3 million or something views. I made a lot of money from that. It was like the first time I was like, what the hell is happening? And overnight my channel grew to like 60,000 followers and it kind of took off from there. I think the problem that comes with that is just as Vivian said, it's like after the high, if everything else doesn't perform super well, you're like, oh my God, what did I, what did I do? Right. It's, the answer is you didn't do anything. The algorithm gods just like picked a video to like reward you for being consistent. People found the topic interesting and then therefore it got blasted to more people. And that's it. When your content doesn't blow up, it doesn't mean it's bad. It just means that not as many people have seen it. I think that's, that was a good like lesson for me to have. Yeah, for sure. And I can tell that you learned a lot from it. But then on the flip side, how well have you dealt with trolls 
because with the caveat of like putting yourself out there and being really vulnerable, there's always going to be people who um, have something negative to say. So how have you been dealing with those situations? I have been flipping. <laughs> Chloe's laughing because she knows what I'm about to say, but um, I flipped a lot of my trolls comments and turn them into roast videos of those people instead. And listen, I know we're like not supposed to like fight fire with fire here, but those are some of the videos that have best performed on my channel. They've really, really resonated with a lot of other, in particular women, people of color, trying to get smart about their money and feeling like this is a common comment that a lot of us are getting. And so it's really helped not only grow my channel, but grow it with the right type of follower that is really aligned with my messaging of like empowering these communities. And I think when I make a roast video of a troll comment, it actually deters other trolls from commenting because they're like, oh, like this girl isn't just going to take it. Like she's going to come for me and she's going to have receipts and it's going to be embarrassing. And I think I have to do one of those videos probably once every few months or so because I need to rem remind these people that I'm not going to take their disrespect just because they're sitting behind a keyboard. No, plus on that, I personally on TikTok, I find those videos like the most interesting to watch. I was just like, go off, please. Yes, vent the frustration. Um, but I think for me on YouTube, uh, you get a lot of more long form hate comments. And for me, at least that hits really hard. Cause like, I'd be like, oh yeah, this person, you know, took the time out of their day to write like a paragraph and a half about why they like disagreed with this thing I said in my video, right? And because YouTube, there is like an editing process after that. So I don't know, for me, it like hits harder the comments. Like I will not lie. I do compulsively check comments on my YouTube videos when I was posting. I'm currently on an eight month hiatus. Um, and it was really scary all the time. Most com most like recently though, I think what I realized is I did a video with CNBC Make It. I was on their like Gen Z money feature. And there were a lot of people commenting me about me in a way that I wasn't used to. Cause like being on my channel, people like have a certain perception of me. And then being on CNBC, people have like completely like a different perception. So I think what I learned from there is like, um, whenever, whatever we see on social media, like really is just super one-sided and very like faceted. But if you view about it in that sense, it's like when strangers comment on you, it really, you really shouldn't take it to heart. I think it's only when, again, it links to your personal brand. And then in some cases it might start affecting your personal life. Then that might be something you want to like draw a line at. Like I get a lot of like inappropriate and sexual comments in my Instagram requests, just because, um, being a woman on the internet. So I would say that that's like something you really need to like tiptoe around. Noted. So I feel like what we can take away from that is from Vivian's point, maybe you don't, you can make a roast video if you want to, but you don't have to go to that extent. And from your point, Chloe, I guess it's just finding that balance of um, making light of it to the best that you can. I mean, I know I took advice from this. My TED talk is going to be on the internet soon. And my coach and team have been very like, you need to be prepared for trolls. But I'm like, I kind of just want to make a joke about it. <laughs> um, I'm saying this now, but then hearing from you both and seeing that you're like, still breathing after troll comments. I'm like, okay, it's going to be fine <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, okay, so then since all of you have had full-time careers, whether it's in school or in the workforce, also alongside content creation and then outside of it, how have you navigated um, deciding whether or not to be a content creator full-time or not? And then how do you foresee it turn it into something with longevity. Maybe we can talk from, I mean, I, yeah, it'd be interesting to hear from all three of you since you come from different perspectives. Maybe Alex, um, you can start off. Yeah, mine is a quick answer in the sense that I'm not interested in becoming a full-time content creator at this moment in my life. I'm not like closing that door for the future, you know, um, life happens, and and it's it's great to have a platform to to share a mess to share your message. But um, at this point, like I mentioned earlier, I'm really trying to invest in myself and the skills I need to further in my career in order to become that a cross industry leader in mental health. Um, so content creation has been an avenue for me content creation and storytelling really uh, i think storytelling is maybe a better way 
for me to uh, describe it, has been an avenue for figuring out what I want to do and my career path. Um, but it right now, I'm not. I'm not looking at full-time content creation, but Chloe and Vivian, I know you have different paths and different stories, so. We can pass it to Vivian, okay, perfect. Oh, okay, perfect. Um, so I was working full-time on Wall Street, pivoted that career to work in tech and media at BuzzFeed. I did that for almost four years and I was super, super happy in my job. I will have to say, I know we've all seen the why I left Buzzfeed YouTube videos, but I did not have that type of experience. Like I had a really good time there. I was being paid very fairly. I had a great manager, great team. So while I was creating all this content, I had a really hard time leaving because I thought I had a cherry seat. I was being treated right. I was making a lot of money and it wasn't until I started to realize that my full-time job was limiting what I was able to do with your rich BFF that I started to want to leave. Um, I was getting opportunities for TV shows, podcasts, book stuff. And I was like, wow, this is all amazing. But I literally do not have the hours in the day to do this because I have my full-time job and I'm doing your rich BFF entirely on the weekends. And I was definitely very, very burnt out. But once I saw that my annual revenue for 2020, what year are we in? 2022. Oh my gosh, that's so embarrassing. Um, was run rating more than what I was making at my full-time day job. I felt confident that I could make up that money it, through just your rich BFF stuff. And on top of that, have the time for more opportunities. So I went ahead and quit my job this past, this March. So about three months ago. Wow. Congratulations. Thanks. And how about you, Chloe, as a student? Because you haven't graduated. Yeah. Right. That's why it's a little bit harder for me because it's like, I don't have a job, period. And so I can't really choose between two. But I think for me, the reason why I will probably never do content full time is mainly two things. One is because I really like producing content, but I think if like that was all I did, my self esteem and my sense of self-worth would literally just be based off of my numbers like as much as I reason with something I know it's wrong like I know myself well enough that it's just not going to happen like I'm going to tie the two together and so I think like mentally just wouldn't be a good idea and on the other hand it's because my content's around my life I don't particularly want to center my life around like day in the life of like a content creator, day in the life of an influencer. I think there are a lot of like more like tech related things I want to do, like products I want to manage and code I want to write. And I think I'd rather center my content around that. But I would say that that comes with some, you know, um, difficulties doing, trying to do content creation part-time and like a full-time job. You have to find a company that's cool with that. Um, before I worked at Intuit, I was at Citadel. That was probably the opposite of cool with that, that you can go in this industry. Um, and they were not okay with me doing at any sort of anything. Like I didn't have to put it on it. Like because I was there, I couldn't post like a picture of my lunch. Right. So like you have to have it's like, the flex sorry, you have to have the flexibility to find um, a company that like can work with that. And then beyond that point, you know, you have to make some limitations on the amount of money you can make with YouTube. If I pursued YouTube full-time, like currently, I could probably make like $50,000 a year with like a hundred thousand followers. And hopefully with that grows, that number will increase. Right. Um, but I'm just not going to be able to do that as much because I also want a full-time job. That makes complete sense. And you also kind of answered a question that I had specifically, I would say for you and Vivian around platforms and monetization, because it seems like you were both in your bag in YouTube and in TikTok in terms of um, being able to monetize it. So how did you decide that TikTok and YouTube were gonna be the platforms where you could make um, money from your content? And like, what would you advise people who want to monetize their content creation to, do in terms of picking a platform? Yeah, I would say I have like a pretty, I would say different revenue, like different lines of businesses than Chloe does. So I haven't posted any long form content on YouTube yet, just short form. Um, and my follower count on YouTube is only like 25,000. So it's not a channel that I'm super heavy into at this moment, but the large majority of my revenue comes from branded partnerships. Um, in addition to pay directly from the platform. So TikTok pays me, Meta pays me, 
um Pinterest pays me I know you guys um but also like I think it's really important to talk about you know to the point of monetizing and longevity that's why I'm now currently pursuing a podcast a book deal potential TV opportunities because I don't want to just be a digital only creator because that brand deal money is so good but if it does dry up because we go into a recession or you know if it slows down you just can't rely on that money and that is the probably scariest thing of becoming a content creator is I do yeah. not have a w2 job to rely on I am not getting a paycheck every two weeks if I don't work I don't eat and you got to make sure that you're getting paid um I will say that I've been really really fortunate that with my current following size for this year I'm run rating to make you know multiple seven figures from partnerships and what my business is currently doing but again, as a content creator, I think it's also important to call out that after making, you know, multiple seven figures, you have huge, huge expenses, both from my very amazing management team, my agent, my lawyer, I have to pay a ton of taxes. I have to, you know, spend money on the $8,000 light and camera that I had to buy. And there's a lot of things that folks don't really think about when they are going into content creation that, it's not just about making money. It's about how do you spend that money wisely to help you make more. Facts. It's um, so good to look the realities. Sorry, go on, Chloe. Oh, I was just going to say it's good for people to hear the realities because you hear seven figures and you're like, oh, amazing. Of course, I'm going to quit like my finance job or my job at Marky yeah. where I thought my salary was great, but I can double it. But then those expenses add up. Yeah. You're not banking your revenue number. You're banking what you get after you pay off everybody on your team. You pay off the people who are working for you. You pay, like, there's just so many things to consider. For sure. I think one thing that people need to be careful of about going into YouTube, especially when we see a lot of, like, YouTubers, you know, going, um, like, quitting your job or dropping out of school to be a YouTuber, et cetera. I think there are a couple of things that you need to keep in mind. First of all, it's like, yeah, most of the money is going to come from brand deals unless your video goes viral. Um, for example, for my viral video, YouTube paid me, I think around $30,000. And for my brand deals, I get on average, I think $2,000 for a two minute insert in one of my videos, which is permanent FYI, but like, you know, it's, it's a large sum of money for like two minutes of talking about a product, right? And you get the free product. Um, I think the important thing to understand is that like, depending on the category you are in, you, are get, you get paid very, very differently. Highest earning category on YouTube is children's toys. So that's your thing. Uh, I think you make like $60 per thousand views you get, which is FYI insane. Um, but other than that is everything finance related, insurance, banking, drop shipping, any e-commerce, you know, any sort of money related thing, you get paid up to like $35 per thousand views. To contrast that for the majority of content on YouTube, fashion, lifestyle, educational stuff, AKA like the stuff I usually do, other than that one viral video where I made about how much money I make tutoring, you make around five to six dollars per thousand views. So in terms of ad revenue, it varies a lot based on the category you're in. So I think if you're in kind of like in it to make money, you have to do that smartly. But, you know, at the same time, like, is that what you're passionate about, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why you have to, you know, just take it with a grain of salt. Like if you see a credit card YouTuber saying he makes like millions a year, you probably won't be able to replicate that by talking about a completely different category. Like that's just the reality of it. Um, and I think that's really important when you decide, you know, between like your career and your channel. But I will say that YouTube is very good with passive um, income. I haven't been on YouTube in eight months. I still get around like $500 a month or something just based off of people watching my past videos. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a caveat that you should pay attention to. It's great. And that's also good to know which categories actually make the most money, because I think since I'm sure, especially us, since when we think about like YouTube content creators, it was really like the comedians and like fashion and beauty influencers who really have like stake over our generation. So to think that they're then at the bottom of the totem pole when it comes to actually making money, I think that's good for a lot of future content creators to keep in mind. But then Alex, since you said um, that your career, you don't really see it becoming a career based off of content creation, even though you're open to it. How has the content that you've created in the past then helped you um, with your career platform as a whole? That's a great question. Um, and I think it's why when I think about um, 
my work, I put it in the bucket of storytelling, um, which maybe you can relate to because it's very related to your upcoming TED talk that's about to come out. It's really about authenticity, telling your story um, and being your most vulnerable best self um, out there. And like you said, in terms of employers and opportunities, whether they be leadership opportunities, volunteer, et cetera, People see that. People see that in your workspace. They see that in school. Um, they see that when you enter the room that you are willing to be vulnerable and authentic and um, a good listener. So I think and a good listener, a good colleague. I think that a lot of the storytelling aspects um, that I personally enjoy, I am a big TED Talk watcher. I love hearing people's stories. I, I'm a big podcaster. So Vivian, when you launch your podcast, I'm definitely going to uh, you know, subscribe, because I, I just think hearing people's stories is so interesting. Um, and just learning about a new person is so interesting. And those soft skills are so important for career longevity. The hard skills here that, that the folks listening are learning, the hard skills of monetization, you know, all the behind the scenes of like investment in cameras and, you know, um, management, all that's really important. But the soft skills and, and trying to get those down that has the longest run for any career um, that you want to jump into, but especially content creation. And I'm seeing nods, so I'm hoping that's resonating. <laughs> no, it, it definitely is. And I think that's good advice for people who want to center their content creation more so like in the storytelling realm and like public speaking and things, because before you can even get an opportunity, a lot of times they want to see your speaker reel. They want to see that you've like um, had opportunities where you've shown yourself to be able to speak in front of crowds but it's like you can't do that if you don't have opportunities so it's good to like get um your story out there in a way that's going to help you continue to grow your platform um okay so i think chloe touched on this a little bit when she was talking about those 24 hours i mean yeah 24 hours super vulnerable videos that she'll post and then delete but other than posts like that we all know that the internet is forever and that can be a positive and a negative thing, especially when you're creating a career around content creation. So how do you battle with the fact that what you post essentially can live online longer than some of us will, um, but then also juggling that as um, young professionals who are continuing to grow and evolve? That's a tough one because I think the internet is so focused on like cancel culture now, right? Like you say one wrong thing and suddenly you're canceled. But, you know, I think Alex, Chloe and myself had a pretty like poignant off the record conversation about how it shouldn't be cancel culture. It should be conversation culture. If you say something wrong in a video, like it's okay for people to correct you, but the hope is that the next time you make something about that content, you know better. Um, I would say that, you know, these days, like, because my content is very like innocuous, it's not as high of a risk as I would say, like even just like Chloe putting in, out information about her own personal life. Yeah. Um, but it is something that I'm concerned about. And like, you know, I, I've done a full like nuclear wipe of my existence on the internet before yeah. like 2016. Cause I just like, I was like, I was embarrassing. I was in college. <laughs> I was in high school. Like there are photos of me, like, you know, like dressed up for Halloween and like, not that any of that was like sketchy or anything, but it's like, do yeah. I necessarily want that to be the first thing someone finds when they Google me online? No, yeah. I want the first thing that comes up to be, to be my Bloomberg article. Um, so I just think it's important to know what you are willing to share with the public facing world. That's good. So going back to boundary setting, which you said many times here, that's awesome. What about you, Alex? I mean, I think that I, going back to the boundary setting and thinking about, you know, putting yourself out there being true to yourself is really important. Um, I've never been trolled, but I can imagine, maybe Chloe, you can talk to this. People, when you reach a certain level, people try to pick apart your story 
and be like, oh, that's not true, or that didn't really happen, and kind of like internet gaslight you, which is essentially trolling. Um, But so it really is about being true to yourself, true to your values, and true to your story, especially if you're in the storytelling arena, because nobody, nobody can take your story away from you. Nobody can take your truth away from you. Um, So I guess the piece of advice is don't lie Um, on the internet. I think people can definitely tell when someone is like full face lying. Um, But as long as you're being true to yourself and like that is your authentic story and and those are real experiences that you're choosing to share, um, you can go home with that and sleep well. Mm -hmm. Still staying true to yourself is everything. Yeah. Okay. I, th- I think we can take away the major takeaways from that. Just being honest, we've, we've seen what can happen when um, people aren't. And yeah, I mean, even though we want to get to that conversation culture standpoint, I think we can all agree that we're just not there yet as a society. So until then, we'll continue to be safe. Um, but Chloe, what about you, especially since you're going to graduate next year and then you've been very personal with your platform in the past. So how do you feel about that as you're starting to like apply to jobs and things? So regarding my like internships in the past, it honestly has been a bit more of an asset than I thought it would be. Um, I think because companies view it as like, oh, having discipline, right? It's like like drafting, creating, producing, and then like growing the following. They see that as like a skill set. And I was like, oh, cool. So they don't actually go and watch my videos, thank God, um, because that would make me reevaluate my videos from like 2018. Um, but I think that that was very scary. The first time I rolled up to my internship and the first thing was my manager was like, oh yeah, before you came, the team was like watching like your videos. And I was like, okay, I don't know which one. I don't know how, I don't know how that I, I was just flab- a little bit flabbergasted. I was just like, yeah. oh, that's amazing. Thank you so much for your support, right? Um, I think that's pretty important to go into thinking. Um, but here's the funny thing is that at my inter- current internship, I have gained a mentor who's like a couple years older than I am. And she's an absolutely amazing person who's also a content creator. But because she's almost like, she's not a faceless content creator, but she doesn't tie, like she uses a different name, no social media related, uh, all like separate social media. And because of that, even though her workplace knows about her like content creation, she's kept the worlds really separate. So I was just like brought onto that as like, this is an option. Yeah. To show your face doesn't mean, you know, people have to connect it or be able to like find your like personal social media. So I think for me, honestly, being open has helped me in a lot of ways. I've gotten like through job referrals because of it. I've grown my network a lot. But at the same time, I've had people send me paragraphs about like, you're being inauthentic because in your LinkedIn, you said like in 2016, you did this thing. But then I checked on your Instagram and you actually did this. And I was like, why? <laughs> That's, yeah, so it comes with, it's two-sided, yeah. Got it, yeah, I have to protect yourself from those internet detectives, but I mean, that was all super helpful, and I mean, I want to thank you all on behalf of everyone who is attending this session for all of your insights and being super open with the ups and downs and everything that comes with um, content creation, and especially creating a career out of it, but since you all gave so many insightful, like, tips and tidbits, I'm sure there's plenty of questions from, um, everyone on here. So I think I should hand it over to Natalie so that we can have some time for Q&A. Yeah, awesome. And thank you guys for sharing. Um, everyone who's listening, if you would like to submit some via the Q&A still, I will, I will pull some out and answer. But I think one of the first things that came to mind and you guys are having these conversations about authenticity and um, kind of being being a little bit like cutting through some of the the chaff that exists online and the secrecy behind some of this is um, Chloe and Vivian, especially you guys touched a lot on sort of the financial realities of being in this career. How difficult was that for you to learn to manage and then to be able to share with people? Because I think that's the one question people have, right? Is like, you do this for a job, A, is that stable? But then B, like, how did you learn how to do that? Because I think people, you know, would like to make a little bit of side money or maybe one day turn it into the full-time job. But there is a kind of information gap there on how that all works. I'll say that I was really fortunate in that I was working as a salesperson at BuzzFeed. So I was essentially doing something similar, but instead of selling myself and the Yo Rich BFF brand, I was selling BuzzFeed to corporate partners um, for much bigger ticket prices. However, um, it did help explain to me the basics of CPM math and how media buyers 
are buying placements. Um, so I would say that like from the jump of like my like uh, social media career and having partnerships with brands, I was probably pricing myself a lot more fairly than most content creators do. I think a lot of content creators make the mistake of undervaluing themselves, knowing that, you know, feeling like, oh, like if, if I ask for too much, the brand's going to walk away. Trust me, the brand's not going to walk away. They need you. Um, so I think it's really important to value yourself highly and respect how much time and effort it takes to create content. Um, but in addition to that, I think navigating not having a paycheck every two weeks or twice a month was a very, very weird adjustment for me. Um, I will say that it's not been the most easy. I bought my home with my partner while I still had my W2 job and we had made a decision, an active decision for me not to quit my job until we bought our home because now my income, even though it's quite robust, would not count against our earnings because it's not dependable money. So there's a lot of things that you need to think about, right? Chloe's like, what? Yeah, I know. Um, because of a W-2 job, you get the same number every two weeks, essentially. And the banks, when they assess you and you know assign you a mortgage, like can depend on that money. Whereas like when you're a content creator, there are a lot of things that you don't have access to that the everyday person might. Um, same with like business banking, like they're going to ask you a bunch of questions and they're going to ask for paperwork. And sometimes as a content creator, you just don't have it. Um, I also think that like being smart and managing my finances in a way that takes into account that I'm not going to be paid every two weeks. Like I'm going to get paid probably once a month and it's going to be a lump sum. So I need to make sure that I can bridge the gap from today to next month is really important. Um, just being able to think differently because you're no longer a, you know, stable W2 employee, you're a 1099 employee. I think that for me, it was a little easier as well. I'm a college student, right? Like my personal expenses are really not that high. Um, I think like on a bad month, um, like that, I like overspend, including rent, I probably spend around like $2,000 maybe. Um, and so for me, because I have my like part-time job tutoring since I was like in high school, um, I do make like stable income. And so for me, anything YouTube gives me is just extra. I just like stick it in like a, like an, a separate account and I like don't touch it until I like want to treat myself, right? Say so, like go on a trip somewhere and like want to do it like independently, then that's my money. So I think for me, it wasn't really about like managing my money in terms of like my life expenses, but like how to view my YouTube income, because I think that way, like how you view it will change the way you value yourself at first, because I was just viewing it as like leisure money. Like, oh, if I make $500, it's like 500 extra to spend on dinner this weekend, something like that. Then as a result, I was like asking brands for less and I would like settle for less. Um, but I chose early on not to take any brand deals until I really liked the company. And so in my inbox, you'll find a lot of educational agencies being like, oh, you make like how to get into your Chicago videos. Like we want to sponsor you, we ask people to use our agency. And I was just like, do I really want my name to be tied to like a company that I don't know that much about? And the answer is no matter how much money they give me is no. And so I chose like companies that I really liked, right? Like Notion, love it, use it every day, amazing, stuff like that. And because of that, my narrowed my scope of companies down and I made decisions based on the companies and not based on money and money. So that's a privilege I have. And that's not something everyone will be able to do. But I would say if you're a college student not doing this for money, you should have like a similar mindset. Amazing. Um, I think another question that we had that came in that I think is super interesting is there are a ton of social media platforms out there and platforms in general, right? You're talking there's TikTok and YouTube, but also these sort of long form videos in TEDx, in um, in podcasts and everything. If you were to start sharing and creating content today, sharing your story, what is like the kind of the one that you would you would recommend to people and what do you feel works best for the kind of content you um, share? Alex, I'm going to start with you because I think you have a really interesting take on this as someone who does focus so heavily on sh on storytelling as, as part of their brand. 
Yeah, so the platform that I originally used, and there is a way to monetize, although I will admit, fully admit I've been taking a step back because I didn't get to that point where I was like, oh, I'm going to invest time to monetize, was Medium. Um, Medium is a great storytelling platform. There is a way to monetize it, and a lot of people do. Um, it's it's essentially a, a, a blogging platform for those who don't know. Um, and, and that's where I shared my story, um, got other volunteers to share their stories as well, um, all through this Obama Foundation um, fellowship opportunity. So that's the platform I chose and then for storytelling and then kind of built out a quote unquote branded Instagram and, and Twitter. And then my LinkedIn was just there from college for like because everybody has, you kind of have to create a LinkedIn for <laughs> for when you go to college. So my LinkedIn um, was kind of the same. So that that's how I started and started to map out where to go first. Again, thinking about my North Star and my intention and what I really wanted the content to do, which was share stories. Toby, I'm going to call in you. I know we've been letting you host for now, but you have a lot of different platforms between a podcast, um, your blog, TEDx, which is amazing. Um, which do you think is sort of your favorite way of sharing out to the world? Um, and which do you think works the best for the, the storytelling that you do? It's hard because I like pop culture is at the center of everything I've ever done and like loves my entire life. So that's a major facet of me. It's like what I do in my nine to five at Disney and then what I do in my personal life. So then when I got into TEDx and then found out then that I was getting bumps to TED, all of my friends were like work in entertainment and things were like, Toby, are you ready? Because now you're going to be seen as this like girl who's talking about, um, mental health and like the effects that it had on herself like as a black woman people are gonna look at you as the spokesperson for this and I was like oh my gosh you're right like and I didn't think about it before it kind of turned in. I can't say it's a happy accident yet because I don't know what's gonna happen when it gets posted but um it's like I had been so used to talking about other people and making that my brand and then suddenly my brand switched to becoming about myself so then when I was working with like my team and my coach to like figure out okay how am I going to merge the two worlds we kind of landed on my whole like story being I want to inspire the youth um, through pop culture and storytelling so kind of like merging my own stories my own experience and then the effects that I think it can have on pop culture which I love so much and making sure that my story, like our stories are told in an accurate way um, through the mediums that we enjoy music TV film then then I'm doing my job so it was kind of like me merging the two worlds and finding a way to make sure that I can be myself and authentic and and both so that's where I'm at and we'll see how it <laughs> performs Viv I think turning it to you then you have also a really interesting opportunity right now because you right you started off on TikTok you grew this amazing platform you're growing an Instagram platform but there are things kind of in the pipeline for you so how did you decide to take on like to take on more than that and what you're going to take on and kind of and kind of what you're going to share it to those different audiences and different platforms yeah I think if I was just starting out my content creation again I would probably focus on short form first, just because it helps you grow that audience so quickly. Um, so I'm talking about like TikTok and like everything, every single app that's tried to create a replica. So like Instagram reels, Facebook reels, YouTube shorts, Snapchat spotlight, like Pinterest idea pins, like the, every single platform has something that's basically TikTok. Um, because you can create one asset and post it across all of those channels that really helps you build up your audience now that i have an audience a lot of them they are the impetus for the podcast the book potential tv because they have been asking me for longer form content and that's also the impetus is why i'm going to start creating long form content on youtube um it felt like they would watch my short form content be like this was helpful now i can go do my own research but i would love to watch a longer piece of content by you about the same topic where you give me more details that you've done the research on and make it even easier. So I think creating 
an audience of people who are willing to listen to you talk for 60 seconds is really important because you are then able to translate those people who will listen for 60 seconds into people who will listen to five to eight minutes on YouTube, as well as, you know, um, 30 to 45 minutes for a podcast or a TV show and even longer read an entire book by you. Amazing. And Chloe, I'm going to throw it to you, but I'm also going to ask you, as you kind of talked about shifting, you know, as you graduate and maybe not keeping content creation a full-time thing or shifting it to be more focused on, you know, the future that lies ahead versus the school experience, have you had any thoughts about shifting platforms or, or changing the way you share your content? Yeah, so I was reading that question too, and I really liked it. So I was going to tie it into it again, but yeah, we have the same thought. Um, I would say if you want to do like a caveat that depending on the type of person you are in your relationship with social media. Um, I didn't start out with TikTok because I wasn't someone who was chronically online. Um, like I, I couldn't be because I had like school to deal with. So I couldn't be, you know, researching like the newest trending TikTok sounds or like looking at TikTok trends or like engaging with similar creators as I do on TikTok, et cetera. And so I chose YouTube because I feel like I could just like put it out there like once a week and then like not look at it until like the next week and then like put it out there. It was more like offline work. Like I spend like, 80%, 85% of the time filming, shooting, editing, and then like 10% of the time is spent on like replying comments and occasionally watching other people's videos and stuff. So because of that, I chose YouTube. But I would say if you want to go for that like exposure, TikTok is unbeatable. Like I've seen people with like 10 followers on TikTok blow up overnight to become like 100,000 if they go viral, right? But because of that, it's also very unstable. So like that, yeah, exactly. Like that's, that's like the trade-off you'd have to have. For me, as I change as a person, I experienced this heavily with my viral video. My viral video was about money. It was about like how much money I make. That is not what the majority of my channel is about. My majority of channel is about like my life at UChicago, but because the video that went viral was so focused on money, suddenly I had this influx of an audience that wanted a specific type of content for, like from me. And so if I posted anything that wasn't that, the metrics would drop so bad because they're, that's not what they're here for, right? And I really hated that. So my response to that was just dipping for like two months, allowing the viral to pass, which is like the opposite of like the kind of advice they give you to monetize your growth. But I just didn't want that to be my brand. And so I just left for two months. Um, and now I'm on an eight month leap because I just don't have time for it. I wanna focus on getting a job. Um, and so I've decided to do that. But I recently started a TikTok because I wanted to have a separate avenue for a specific type of content. My YouTube is going to be in my mind. My YouTube is going to be my like personal life. Whatever I'm doing, I'm just going to document it and put it on YouTube. My tech focused stuff, like me tech recruiting, me struggling, coding, me like angry in the middle of the night, raw stuff is currently on TikTok. It's been like two week projects so far. I'm not going to monetize my Instagram because Instagram is my happy place. Um, and I don't care about my LinkedIn enough. So I also don't care about that. So the smart thing to do would be to have a consistent brand throughout all of your social media, uh, much like Vivian does and like grow all of them. But I chose not to do that because I don't have time to, so I don't really want to, because like, I don't know what kind of content I'm going to focus on just yet. So I've chosen to kind of like divide them up and just have fun with it. That's my approach. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I, seeing that we are nearly at time, I want to say thank you to everyone. Um, thank you to our wonderful panelists. Thank you, Toby, for, for hosting us and guiding our conversation. Um, I, I've learned a lot. And if you want to keep an eye out on these amazing alumni and the work that they're doing now, what's going to happen in the future, um, I will share all of their their social media handles and their work in our post-event email. Um, we do have a few more uh, events coming up in our Young Professional series. And I am excited to share that with you guys. Um, here's a link. I think one that may be of particular interest to all of you who are working um, in the creative spaces would be our Freelance with Your Creativity program happening next week. Um, there will be a survey that pops up at the end of this meeting and we appreciate if you take it to share your thoughts and also some ideas for future content planning so we can um, make best use of your time and our time. Thank you for being here today, everyone. And we hope to see you all soon. Thanks everyone. Thanks guys.